December 4, 1992, President George Bush announced he was sending up to 28,000 U.S. troops to Somalia to help provide humanitarian relief in a strife-torn country where hundreds of thousands of people had died of starvation. Not quite a year later, shortly after a failed raid that took the lives of 18 American servicemen, President Bill Clinton announced an exit strategy for the United States. In less than a year, the United States went from welcomed savior to embattled occupier. How did this happen? What went wrong? How did a mission of mercy that won almost universal acclaim for its humanitarian intentions turn into another armed intervention in a developing country? Today, America's Defense Monitor examines what went right and wrong in the U.S. and U.N. in Somalia. America's Defense Monitor. A weekly program on the military and international affairs that affect you, your family, and people throughout the world. Here is your host, Admiral Jean Larocque. Welcome once again to America's Defense Monitor. Just a few years ago, many Americans had never heard of Somalia, and fewer still knew where it was on the map. But we were bombarded by pictures of starving and dying Somalis, and in a humanitarian gesture, we Americans sent a combat unit of 25,600 men and women to Somalia to save the Somalis from themselves. We went in to feed the Somalis and bring order out of chaos. We've learned a lot from that operation. It did not go exactly as planned, and our program is on that subject today. Somalia is a nation of recent origin. Located on the Horn of Africa, it only became a nation in 1960 after the merger of former British and Italian colonies. But it has long been an area of strife and conflict, dominated by foreign powers for over 100 years. British, French, and Italian imperialism all played a role in the region in the 19th and 20th centuries. The British established a protectorate in the northern regions in 1886. Italy established a colony in the southern regions shortly thereafter. During World War II, the British captured the Italian colony. But in 1950, it became a UN trust territory, and Italy returned as the administering power for 10 years. In 1991, Somalia had a population of about 7.2 million and an area about the size of Texas. Here's a brief history. In 1970, dictator Siad Barre came to power. He was to rule for the next 21 years through brutal oppression and by pitting different clans against each other. Somalia and the Soviet Union began a close relationship in 1966. This lasted until 1976. During that time, the Soviets supplied about $600 million worth of arms and military equipment to Somalia. After the Soviet Union pulled out in 1977, the United States became Barre's primary benefactor. According to a recent analysis by the Congressional Research Service, the United States delivered to Somalia about $154 million worth of weapons and military equipment from 1981 through 1991. Siad Barre was driven from power in January 1991 by the United Somali Congress, an insurgent movement formed largely of members of the Hawiya clan. This created a power vacuum and began the descent into anarchy for Somalia. One faction of the United Somali Congress, headed by Ali Mahdi Mohammed, claimed it controlled the government. Another faction, headed by Mohammed Farah Idid, disputed this. Civil war ensued. Contrary to many press reports, Idid is widely regarded in Somalia as a patriot, scholar, and military genius who was the deciding force in the overthrow of former dictator Siad Barre. It was this war, coupled with bad harvests, which led to the horrifying scenes of starvation that were televised around the world in 1992. By the end of 1992, about 350,000 Somalis had died. 
another 1.5 million, close to one-fourth of the remaining population, were thought to be in danger of starvation without massive food aid. Here was a society that had literally collapsed. The bottom had dropped out. It was like a, the kind of a society you would expect in a post-nuclear war environment. It just happened in slow motion over the period of that two-year civil war uh, triggered by uh, you know, the, the overthrow of Siad Barre. David Evans is an expert on military affairs and a retired Marine Corps lieutenant colonel. He covered Operation Restore Hope as a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Although various international relief groups tried delivering food and other humanitarian aid, their efforts were thwarted by continued fighting among the clans, many of which used food as a weapon by stealing, hoarding, and denying it to the people. Pressure was building for someone to do something. The UN tried sending in 500 ill-equipped and ill-trained UN peacekeepers in accordance with a previously passed Security Council resolution. The UN could not get agreement from clan leaders to stop fighting. And when some peacekeepers did arrive in Mogadishu, they were forced to stay in their quarters due to the civil war. It was this continued fighting and starvation which led to Operation Restore Hope, the intervention commanded and controlled by the United States that lasted from December 1992 through May 1993. The limited objectives announced for the operation were to, quote, open supply routes, get food moving, prepare the way for a UN peacekeeping force, unquote. Still, there is more than one view as to why exactly the United States went in. David Evans thinks more than mere humanitarianism might have been involved. There's also speculation that uh, Somalia could be rich in natural gas and oil. And so if we're looking at uh, the eventual depletion of our proven oil reserves, Somalia could take on immense importance. Indeed, when I got back from my own trip uh, to Somalia, I called the American Petroleum Institute. And sure enough, there have been very recent surveys, uh, as recent as 1990. And uh, there have been substantial uh, finds of natural gas uh, in the offshore uh, fields. Uh, clearly, when, uh, when you have uh, these kinds of findings of uh, natural gas, uh, there is a high probability that oil uh, also uh, is to be found in, in Somalia. Others believe the United States had an obligation to help Somalia. In addition, I thought the U.S. had something for which to, uh, to atone. Randall Robinson is the Distinguished Executive Director of TransAfrica, an influential foreign policy lobby for Africa and the Caribbean based in Washington. And then we, of course, had the colonial period with the British and the Italians and following that, nine years of uh, democracy in Somalia which was overthrown by Siad Barre, uh, and uh, who saw that we were giving uh, support at the time to Haile Selassie uh, in Ethiopia, their arch enemy, and he applied for support from the Soviet Union. And then the arming of Somalia began when Haile Selassie was overthrown, replaced by a leftist, Mengistu in Ethiopia. After Somalia invaded the Ogaden region of Ethiopia, Mengistu found a new patron in the Soviet Union. The United States switched sides and took over as an arms supplier to Somalia. We adopted uh, Siad Barre and the Carter administration from 1977 to 1989 supplied uh, Siad Barre with uh, $887 million in U.S. Uh, foreign assistance, including $200 million in arms. And so what had been a peaceful pastoral society uh, became an armed camp. This is a country already awash in automatic weapons. I mean, there is an arms bazaar. You go to downtown Mogadishu and what passes, you know, for a shopping center there, and uh, you can buy virtually any, any weapon made in, in the world. Others thought it was, by 1992, simply a case of doing the right thing. Clearly, we had a, a, a mission in 1992 that the American people strongly supported, and that was to keep a million people or more from starving to death. John McCain is a Republican senator from Arizona. He is a combat veteran of the Vietnam War and a leading member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Perhaps it was not in the United States' vital national security interests, but certainly as a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles, uh, we felt that it was the right thing to do. David Evans thinks there was also an element of self-justification at work as well. But I, I think you're, you're really looking at uh, a military in search of alternative missions, the drug interdiction, the humanitarian, the disaster relief, the range of jobs 
uh, by which they could show how useful they can be in the Cold War, uh, in the post-Cold War era. By most accounts, the U.S. intervention, Operation Restore Hope, was a success. Fighting in the capital city of Mogadishu was reduced. Food deliveries were made in the countryside, and starvation was greatly reduced. American troop strength peaked at 25,600. The operation was not without costs. Eight Americans were killed during Operation Restore Hope. The financial cost was also high. According to the Pentagon, the cost of its operations in Somalia through May 1993 was about $760 million. Initial estimates are that the subsequent UN operation in which the United States participates could total over a billion and a half dollars. The US share of that UN cost would be $480 million, altogether over $1 billion in US costs. The United States also made some almost disastrous mistakes in efforts to bridge the cultural gap that existed when it first intervened in Somalia. David Evans explains the problem with a leaflet distributed by U.S. military forces as part of a psychological campaign to convince Somalis of the good intentions of U.S. military forces. If you look at the back, there are a number of physical spelling errors in the text. And the first word here, adunka, uh, uh, literally translated means uh, slave. Uh, it should have uh, been spelled advanka uh, for United Nations. So you have uh, the first two words, instead of reading United Nations, read slave nations. Randall Robinson believes the United States missed an important opportunity to bring about peace during Operation Restore Hope. I think it was quite right to go in uh, uh, with the Restore Hope uh, operation. At the same time, I said at the time, that uh, unless we got the weapons out of uh, Somalia with some kind of uh, disarmament uh, uh, initiative, uh, we would be back in the same stew uh, once uh, this, uh, the crisis, uh, the, the famine part of this had been, had been dealt with. And uh, we would see uh, uh, the starvation again in the, in the country. There was no appetite uh, for disarmament uh, on Capitol Hill or in the White House at the time. It was never done. Others believe disarmament was never a viable option. You cannot disarm this country by force, for example. If you're talking about search and clear operations where you cordon off entire blocks of Mogadishu and, and sweep through, uh, you're not going to get all the arms that are buried in people's backyards, that are buried out in the country. On May 4th, 1993, Operation Restore Hope ended. It was succeeded by Unison II the multilateral UN operation. Approximately 25,000 troops from about 30 nations, including Bangladesh, India, Italy, and Pakistan, deployed in place of the United States. By that point, most US troops had returned home. The US presence was reduced to about 4,500 troops providing logistics support to United Nations personnel, plus a separate quick reaction force that remained under US command and the Rangers, also under U.S. command, who tried to hunt down Idid. It was after the removal of most U.S. forces that problems began to pile up. One was what is called mission creep, the addition of more not clearly defined goals. Senator McCain explains. That mission, as we all know, changed rather dramatically as a result of United Nations Security Council resolutions from one of keeping people from starving to peacekeeping, warlord hunting, nation building, whatever. Another problem, according to Senator McCain, was the Clinton administration's failure to consult with Congress. One of them is not coming back to consult with Congress because of the change in mission, but more importantly, uh, without really thinking through what the consequences of a very dramatically shifted priorities uh, entailed and the possible consequences. Perhaps the biggest failure was that the United States lost its reputation of impartiality and began to be seen as a foreign power taking sides in Somalia's civil war. No matter what uh, one feels inside, you must always disguise that uh, because you, you can't do effective peacekeeping uh, without, um, uh, without um, uh, that kind of impartiality. We didn't. Uh, we, we, early on, uh, indicated uh, 
uh, that we favored some and, and, and didn't favor others. And of course, uh, Mr. I.D. was one of those that we, uh, we indicated uh, hostility towards very early, and that was a major mistake before the June killing of the Pakistanis. David Evans sees a similarity to 1983, when U.S. soldiers participated in a multinational peacekeeping force in Beirut, Lebanon. There are certain chilling parallels to Beirut, where the United States uh, at one fateful uh, juncture called in naval gunfire uh, against uh, one faction, and that polarized the situation for the U.S. forces in Lebanon from that moment on. And that's what led to those stark scenes of the Marines at the airport in Beirut, bunkered in, taking shell fire and sniper fire on a daily, nay, hourly basis. Unfortunately, the administration did not seem to remember that experience. The same seems to be holding in Mogadishu, in the southern part of Somalia. That once we were perceived as taking sides against one or the other factions, we became part of the problem, not part of the solution. Randall Robinson points to an incident that he believes led to an attack on Pakistani peacekeepers in June 1993, an event which caused the UN to put a bounty on Farah Idid's head and the subsequent deployment of U.S. Rangers and members of the Delta Force to try to capture him. The notice that went out um, uh, a day or two uh, before that occurred uh, went to mid-level people uh, in uh, Mr. Idid's forces indicating that uh, his weapons depot uh, would be uh, inspected uh, the, the next day. There was no such notice sent to any of the other militia leaders. It's easy to see how Idid might feel singled out. And so uh, he uh, might clearly have had the impression that there was going to be uh, a, a unilateral uh, disarmament of his forces and, um, and, and, and not as a part of a comprehensive uh, program undertaken across the country with all of the militia leaders. Other difficulties included coordinating activities with the military forces of many nations. As this diagram illustrates, the command and control structure of the UN operation is extremely complex. In addition, according to David Evans, the professionalism of the various military forces was uneven. I had this misgiving when I was there that the United Nations uh, personnel did not have the same energy level as our military uh, officers running this operation, uh, that they did not have the same sense of urgency. Uh, there was a certain uh, odor of incompetence and, and laissez-faire that I thought uh, did not bode well uh, for a strong, coherent, well-led operation after uh, the operation was turned over. Others doubt whether putting military forces in Somalia was ever a good idea to begin with. The United States has no uh, viable military options in Somalia that I know of uh, besides a massive uh, military involvement uh, which would involve the consequent slaughter of innocent civilians. Um, we were treated to the biz bizarre uh, situation where uh, because uh, Mr. Adid's people were using women and children as human shields and we were killing women and children the UN military spokesperson said that now women and children are combatants. We went there to feed them and we ended up killing them. David Evans believes the tilt against Idid predates the killing of the Pakistanis. There certainly seems to have been uh, a, um, uh, a distancing uh, of uh, the senior UN officials uh, from uh, Idid, a refusal to talk to him and so forth. Randall Robinson believes that UN military personnel have also been at fault. You've got uh, now Canadians on trial for murder. Uh, because the uh, Canadians uh, had uh, in their forces their white supremacist cell uh, that, uh, that murdered several people point-blank uh, range uh, in Somalia. Uh, the Belgians, uh, the same thing. Uh, evidence of UN forces throwing uh, Somali civilians off, off bridges. Mr. Robinson believes these charges should be investigated. Well, the Somalis uh, have said, uh, and with justification, that uh, uh, if I.D. Uh, has to account uh, for uh, the, the June uh, situation with the Pakistanis, as, as well he should, then uh, there ought to be an investigation of the UN peacekeeping forces, too, that have uh, apparently committed uh, a number of human rights abuses in Somalia. Canadian military court-martial proceedings are now investigating these allegations.
In the aftermath of the attack on the Pakistani peacekeepers, the UN policy could be summed up in two words, get ID'd. When the jury is in, uh, this whole business of posting uh, wanted posters and, and reward bonuses and things like that uh, for ID'd uh, will go down as, as, a, as a big mistake. It was pursuit of ID'd which led to the disastrous U.S. raid in Mogadishu on October 3rd, resulting in nearly 100 casualties, including 18 dead and 75 wounded Rangers and Delta Force personnel. In the aftermath of this tragedy, Fearing for the safety of our forces there, President Clinton sent more than 7,000 additional troops to Somalia to, quote, protect our forces and enable our forces to complete their mission, unquote. He also set an exit date of March 31, 1994, for U.S. forces to leave Somalia. This raises a question of what will happen once U.S. and U.N. forces leave. Randall Robinson believes that the situation is better than many people think. Americans uh, don't, don't properly understand what has happened in Somalia. We're, we're talking about a crisis in, in one neighborhood of Mogadishu. Uh, the rest of the country has, uh, has been restored to some working order. But even he acknowledges that the prospects for peace after the pullout are questionable. That largely depends on whether uh, the Somalis have been able to, um, to hammer out some basic uh, structure for, for a truce and a lasting peace uh, before that happens. If the pullout um, uh, happens before that can, uh, can, can be successfully accomplished, then I think we're looking uh, down the road towards a disaster. David Evans is less optimistic. Is Somalia savable as a country? You have basically two former colonies that have been sort of grafted together, British Somaliland and Italian Somaliland. They do have, uh, and they are occupied by different clans. I am not entirely certain that Humpty Dumpty can be put back together. According to David Evans, in terms of anarchy and turmoil developing in African countries, Somalia may be just the tip of the iceberg. I remember standing at uh, the Mogadishu airport with uh, Father Bill Joy of the Catholic Relief Service uh, based right out of Baltimore here. And he said, you know, David, Africa is just, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is just sort of slowly sliding towards the, the edge of the cliff. Somalia is just the first country to fall over. What lessons can be learned from our experience in Somalia? Senator McCain believes that the United States must be far more wary in using military forces. It's in our interest to see people being able to uh, survive throughout the world. It's in our interest to see uh, peace and order. But what we have to recognize is the United States cannot do those things. And the United States has to be very careful when it gets involved militarily. Otherwise, uh, we will not only not help the situation, but perhaps over time worsen the situation with a consequent uh, expenditure of American lives and treasure. He also asserts that major problems must be solved before U.S. forces can work effectively with those of other U.N. member nations. We find that uh, some troops that were dispatched there were, uh, there's clearly not clear lines of command and control between them. Uh, obviously, in the, in the case of the deaths of the uh, Rangers, there was a, a real problem with planning and coordination that I think uh, lies on the U.S. side as well as our allies' side, but primarily rests on the responsibility rests on the United Nations. Randall Robinson believes the United States has no alternative to continue working with the U.N. We've got to understand as, as a nation that we cannot police the world anymore. And we've got to do it in concert uh, with, uh, with, the, with the United Nations. And while it may be flawed, uh, it's, it's the only opportunity, the only chance we have to address these kinds of problems. Easier said than done, says David Evans. If there's one central lesson that comes out of this whole venture, it's that it's easy to get in and very hard to get out. It's easy to fly C-130 transports and parachute food. It is much more difficult to repair rebuild and rejuvenate a fractured culture, a fractured political system. It may be that while the end of the Cold War gives the United States and the United Nations more freedom to deal with conflicts around the world,
the costs and risks are increasing. To intervene militarily in civil wars uh, is certainly a not only a non-productive enterprise, but one which is fraught with danger. And we have to understand that there are certain areas of the world that are not on our vital national security interests that unfortunately we can do very little about. If a diplomatic solution is not achieved, then the whole effort in Somalia may have been nothing more than a temporary quick fix. The lessons of the U.S. and U.N. interventions in Somalia are being closely studied. Their impact is felt around the world. The New World Order, which was on everyone's lips just a few years ago, is in the minds of many a New World Disorder. There are numerous ethnic conflicts and civil wars around the world, many of them producing shocking levels of death and destruction. Yet not all of them can be fixed by outside intervention. Solutions to many of them are beyond the capabilities of either the United Nations or the United States. Intervening in such conflicts will mean great dangers bearing great costs, possibly for an indefinite period, and for benefits which are not always clear. Whether the United States continues to go it alone with its own forces or supports the United Nations will depend in large part on which path its citizens decide to follow. The situation in Somalia, I think, has definitely improved, although it did not turn out exactly as all of us had hoped. Since there will be many opportunities for us to become involved in other similar situations in other countries around the world, perhaps we ought to look carefully at the Somali situation to learn what lessons we can for the future. Americans are going to be called upon again to do a similar action, and we ought now to be debating just what role we want to play in other countries. Until next time, for America's Defense Monitor, I'm Gene LaRock.